Uh, good day. We're going to talk about the uh, nature of science and methods in scientific uh, study, uh, a.k.a. we call this the scientific method. This is uh, what scientists use on a daily basis, and um, it's essentially a discipline to investigate and understand nature. That's what science is, and it's an organized way of using evidence to learn about the natural world. Scientists use the scientific method on a daily basis to help solve problems uh, that they're encountering in their um, daily lab lives. Uh, here is an uh, order, uh, two different orders here. On the left we have uh, problem, hypothesis, experiment, observation, record, repeat, experiment, conclusions, and communicate results. Uh, this is the w one that I tend to use. I use the acronym PHEORC, P-H-E-O-R-C-C, uh, which stands for Problem, Hypothesis, Experiment, Observation, Record, Repeat, Conclusion, and Communicate Results. But you don't have to do it in that order. You can do it in the order that is on the right, where you have a problem and you ask a question, and maybe you make some observations, do some research, you formulate your hypothesis, you design your experiment. While you're carrying out your experiment, you record some data, you are always going to repeat the experiment, drop a conclusion, and communicate results. So the first thing that's going to happen is that you are going to encounter a question or a problem that you need to help solve using experimentation. There is always going to be a problem that you encounter first. So for example, this one was existence um, you know, a, a while ago, but it was essentially maggots uh, forming on meat, and it was a hypothesis called spontaneous generation. And this hypothesis was explored by this scientist by the name of Francesco Reddy. He set out to disprove spontaneous generation that maggots didn't form just magically out of meat, that they came from some location. And so he set out in the 1600s to disprove uh, spontaneous generation. And here is Francesco Reddy's experiment. He essentially took some exposed meat and he left it out. And as you can see there, the exposed meat eventually formed maggots there in that first left-hand column there. Uh, he also had some, ma uh, some meat that he placed a piece of paper on. And if you notice there, underneath that... No, um, no maggots formed on that. Then he had a piece of cheesecloth over me, and he left it for a while, same amount of time. The only thing that changed between these three trials is what he put on the meat. He had nothing on the meat here, on the exposed meat. That is called the control. It's called the control because he didn't do anything. He just left it there. That's the normal state. Left it. This one, trial number one, paper on the meat. Notice he put paper on the meat. That's not a control. What did he change between the two? Well, he put paper on the meat. That is something he changed. He changed it. He manipulated it. That's the independent variable. And we're going to talk about those variables later. Another thing he changed over here on the far right, he put cheesecloth on. Okay, that's another variable. Again, that's a uh, manipulated or a independent variable that he uh uh, did and we'll talk about those variables later but anyways he put cheesecloth on the meat and if you notice after that same amount of time there was no maggots well then what he did is he took off the cheesecloth and he left it for a little while and after some time he decided to put the cheesecloth back on well eventually maggots formed underneath the cheesecloth so it led him to believe that maggots formed after the cheesecloth had been taken off. So the cheesecloth was taken off. Something may have landed on the meat during that time, laid eggs, and maggots formed after he put the cheesecloth back on. So having exposed meat to the air led him to believe that that is what was causing maggots to form on the meat. They were not forming out of thin air or spontaneously generating life from nothing. Well, this man, by the name of Louis Pasteur, and many of you probably know who he is, or 
something that he has developed in the scientific community called pasteurization. Well, Louis Pasteur was the first one to come around to successfully disprove spontaneous generation. And this is his experiment here. He had uh, broth, okay, and he poured it into a flask, and he kind of put a cap on the flask and he heated it up. And he heated it up to sterilize it and kill all the bacteria that was in it. And he left it for a long period of time. And lo and behold, nothing ever grew inside there because it had been sterilized. Nothing was able to get in through that curved neck. Okay, Air was able to get in and out, but air is pretty sterile. Okay, But bacteria and other organisms were not able to get in there. Well, eventually he broke the top off. And as you can see there, after he broke it off, he left it for some time, it started to get cloudy and kind of dark colored and mold was growing inside there. That was because bacteria and mold spores were able to fall into the flask and contaminate the solution. Okay, So he was able to actually prove that spontaneous generation did not actually happen. Okay, but what was the difference between Reddy and Pasteur? Well, Reddy in the 1600s, he also said spontaneous generation did not occur. Well, so did Louis Pasteur. Both were right, but nobody actually believed it to be true until Louis Pasteur's experiment. And the reason for that was because of data. Data is the reason people believe uh, or, you know, backed Louis Pasteur's experiment, Reddy did not keep accurate data, even though his hypothesis was correct. It was down to the data. So 200 years had gone by where people believed that spontaneous generation actually happened until Louis Pasteur came around with his experiment and collected good data and I say that slowly because collecting good data is very important. So let's move on from Reddy's experiment and Pasteur's experiment and let's talk about observations. Okay, Observations. We make observations in the scientific community. Uh, observations help us collect data. We use our five senses, our sight, our hearing, our touch, our smell and taste they are all they all provide us with data and information that we use um, in uh, science okay so we use our observations and our senses and we have two different ki kinds of observations we have the quantitative observation which involves numbers so anytime you are counting or measuring like 15 feet or five blue marbles or five marbles anytime you count something that is a quantitative observation. The other type is called a qualitative observation. This is where you measure some characteristic, like the table was rough. Well, we don't count rough. You can count rough tables. There are 15 rough tables. But if you just say the table is rough, that is a qualitative observation, not a quantitative observation. There are blue marbles over there. That is a quantitative, excuse me, a qualitative observation because I didn't say how many blue marbles. There's five blue marbles on the rough countertop. Well, that is a quantitative observation as well as a qualitative observation. But if I just say there are five blue marbles on the countertop, that is a quantitative because I said the number five. I counted. Whenever you count, it's quantitative. If you don't count, like color or texture, it is a qualitative observation. Here's an example of some statements with some observations, whether it's an observation or an inference. Observations are factual. They have to be facts. Pretend object A is a basketball, object B is a table tennis ball or a ping pong ball, whatever you want to call it, and object C, you don't really know what it is. So object A is round and orange. That's an observation. We know it's a basketball, but basketballs don't necessarily have to be orange. They are round and spherical in shape. 
but they don't necessarily have to be orange. They can be black, they can be green, they can be red. Okay, But if you say that it's round or spherical shaped and it's orange, those are facts. Therefore, it's an observation. When you say object A is a basketball, you are inferring that it's a basketball. Not all round orange balls are basketballs. Some may be tennis balls. Some may be golf balls. But if you say it's round and orange, that's a fact, so it's an observation. Otherwise, object A is a basketball, that's an inference. Object C is round and black and white. Again, the facts. It's round, it's black, it's white, those are observations. Object C is larger than B. Again, factual, so it's observation. Object B is smooth. Again, facts, so it's observation. Object B is a table tennis ball. Well, ten again, it's not necessarily factual. So it's table tennis ball, that's an inference. Each object is used in a different sport. That can be both. That one's kind of difficult. Uh, go ahead and just kind of disregard that. I would never include that on a test or anything. Um, it can be both. I tend to put that more towards the observation, but again, that could be an inference. And uh, if you can go ahead and take a wild guess what object C is, if you know that object C is larger than B, it's round, black, and white, and how many of you thought it was a soccer ball? And if you thought soccer ball, soccer ball is an inference, but if you say that that ball is round, black, and white, those are observations. In class, I had you make some observations and write anything down that we used our senses for, and so we're going to skip over that right now and move right on to forming hypotheses. Uh, formulate a hypothesis, you predict a possible answer to a question or a problem. For example, if soil temperature rises, then plant growth will increase. That is a properly stated hypothesis. Hypotheses are always stated as if-then statements. Always stated as if-then. If this, then this. Okay. And I underline soil temperature and plant growth for a reason, and I will get back to that when I talk about the, the variables at the end um, of this uh, section. So hypotheses, if this, then this. Always with if then. So here's an example of a hypothesis. Um, I'm just going to leave this up here for just a moment. Uh, a teacher collected some beetles from a rotting log and placed them into a container of dry oatmeal in her classroom. She kept the box covered with a light cloth so that the beetles would not escape. She also asked one of her students to add potato and apple pieces once a week to provide food and moisture for the beetles. After several weeks, the students reported that there were some strange-looking, look worm-like organisms in the container. I wanted you to um, spend some time, and we did this in class, to formulate a hypothesis that might explain why there's worms in the container. And then write up how you would test your hypothesis, kind of design an experiment. So go ahead and pause the video right now, write up a hypothesis as to why the worms are in the container. Remember, the hypothesis has to be stated as if-then statements. So if there are worms in the container, then, and you come up with the then. And then design how you would test your hypothesis. So in setting up controlled experiments, we always have the hypothesis, if this, then this. Hypotheses should be changed by experiments by where only one variable changes. You're only going to change one variable. And if you remember back on that previous slide when I was showing you about hypotheses, it said, if soil temperature rises, then plant growth will increase. If soil temperature rises, then plant growth will increase. That was a properly stated hypothesis. Only one thing is changing in that variable, and that thing that's going to be changing is the soil temperature, and what's going to respond to that is called plant growth. And we'll get to that in just a second, but types of variables that you can use in your experiment, it, it, there's an endless type uh, or amount of variables you can use, and some variables that you can use are temperature, time, light, the amount grown, how fast an object is traveling, etc., etc. There are many things you can use. Those are variables, okay? And now there's two 
There's actually three types of variables, but there's two I really want you to know. One's called the manipulated variable. This is the variable that you, the scientist, deliberately change. Or it's also called the independent variable. Okay? And the other one is called the man or responding variable. This is the variable that changes in response to whatever you did. So, for example, you're driving in your car, you press your foot down on the accelerator. That is what you deliberately changed. You pressed down on the accelerator. What responded? The car went faster. Okay, and that kind of cuts off there for some reason. I'm not too sure why. Variable that changes due to the independent variable. Okay, the responding variable is the variable that changes due to the independent variable. Okay. And the uh, third type of variable is called a controlled variable, and it's not listed there, but it's the controlled variable. The controlled variable um, is something that you keep the same. If it doesn't change between trials, that's called a controlled variable. This is going to be the type of variable that is usually the most. You have um, tons of controlled variables. Well, I kept the same amount of light the same between the plants. That's a control variable. How long did you leave the plants outside? Oh, I left them outside the same amount of time. That's a control. Time. Same amount of time. Control. Anytime it's the same, it's a control. So now after you have determined what type of variables you have in your experiment, you're going to develop a procedure. Excuse me. Uh, your procedure cannot be vague. It has to be very clear. Step one, do this. Step two, do this. Step three, do this. Very detailed. Uh, next is come up with a materials list. This is a list of everything that the scientist is going to need to in order or in order to repeat your experiment. Some scientists want to repeat other scientists' experiments, and they need exactly to they need to know exactly what they need in order to repeat that experiment. Um, and the last thing is that you need to make sure that the outcome or what you're measuring, it has to be measurable. You have to be able to measure, for, measure it or quantify it, count it in some way. Um, and if you can't, you need to develop a way to measure it. Those are important. If you can't measure it, it's not a controlled experiment. Next up is during your experiment, you need to make sure that you record results. Um, Data collection is extremely important in the scientific community, especially in the um, scientific method. You must record your results. Good data is extremely important. Okay, uh, That data that you collect is used to help draw conclusions um, and determine whether or not your hypothesis uh, is supported or denied. If your hypothesis is supported, it was obviously correct. And it's okay if the data doesn't support your hypothesis because you know then that you need to change your experiment in somehow, okay, or in some fashion. And that's okay if your data doesn't support your hypothesis. You're not wrong. It just needs to, uh, you need to be clear about your data and clear about your hypothesis that my data does not support my hypothesis. This is why. And then you're going to redesign your experiment and test again. And when you uh, take your data, the best way to analyze it is always using tables and charts. Tables and charts allow you to see your data much better than just straight numbers. Using charts and tables will help you in the long run. So practice this skill of taking data and placing them into charts, charts excuse me, and graphs. And last is called a conclusion. You've got to be able to draw a conclusion. Um, does your data accept or reject a hypothesis? Um, make recommendations for further study and improving your experiment and your procedure. Okay. So based on this, just take a moment, pause the video if you need to. Based on the following hypothesis and data, what can you conclude? If states do not require drivers to wear seat belts, those states are called secondary law states, then younger age drivers will be less likely to wear their seat belt compared to older age drivers. So take a look at the data there in the chart.
There's the hypothesis. Remember, secondary law states are states that don't require you to wear a driver's or wear a seatbelt. Younger age drivers will be less likely to wear their seatbelt compared to older age drivers. Look at the data, and what what can you conclude about that data? So in class, we decided to take our knowledge of the scientific method and kind of go through a realistic example. So I'm going to read through this and give you uh, an opportunity to respond um, and write down and try to figure this out as we go through this. So John watches his grandmother bake bread. He asks his grandmother what makes the bread rise. She explains that yeast releases gas and it feeds on sugar. Okay. So John wonders if the amount of sugar used in the recipe will affect the size of the loaf of bread. Okay, so that's a question for him. Okay, and now he's going to make some observations and come up with a hypothesis and go through the entire steps of the scientific method. So, uh, I'm going to stop talking through the rest of this. The slides are going to progress through and you're going to see the data that John collects. You're going to see his hypothesis you're going to see his variables that he chooses. You're going to see his controls. Um, again, you're going to see that data. And you're going to see his conclusion. And I want you to kind of follow along as it goes on and see if you come up with the same conclusion that John does.